Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's session. Could we stand this evening in the house of the Lord as we open in prayer, please? Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Father, for indeed it is the day that you have made. We thank you, God, that your presence is already here. So we welcome your presence tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray, O oh God, that that very presence, your very presence, Lord, would rest upon each and every one gathered here tonight, Lord. We thank you, God, for your manservant and for the rest of this evening session, Lord God, that you would just be with us, that you would guide us. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for understanding hearts tonight, Lord. Let your good and perfect will be done, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have two poems for you. The first poem is from my collection, Tango, and it's 
entitled Echo. Going in the spirit of being concerned for our community and our neighbors, I must remind you that once in a lifetime, give your voices to those persons who do not have an opportunity to speak. So this poem, Echo. There is a newborn baby bundled in a blue blanket, warm and wet. His eyes are tiny black bulbs, his hands, fists. He is a pebble flung far and forcibly flying through the air until his head cracks the concrete in Middle Region. Or was it a street in Kigali? The blanket hugs the salvo of soft bone and scrambled matter as a sigh of sopping blood, warm for a while longer, leaks on the tar top bed where he sleeps. My voice is blue and bruised from hitting the stones in your ears, but I will try again. I will try again like Malcolm, Martin, Mandela, Marley, Malala. I will try again and again and again. This last poem is entitled King. Their minds were a dusty valley of broken bones, parched in the cockeyed glare of fear. Their skin were a rainbow of earth, some banana pale, some velvet purple. In the kingdom of contorted principalities, they were the children in the fire, burned by their ancestry, burned by the people in power. His mind was a glistening aloe of incubated dreams, potent in the ravishing anger of justice. His jawbone was a rattling rifle of pointed preaching, first bursting to pieces the lies and laws, last bursting to pieces his vigor and voice. In the kingdom of whitewashed realities, he consulted the king, took to the streets, and marched against the rotting minds of oppressive men. 29 mugshots plant his presence in prisons where they fill cells with worship, an onslaught of splayed fingers, troops of God's brown children, raising, rising from the crumpled soil, dusting off their knees after spinning their prayers in air into battle tanks and weaponry. The king calling the valley of dried bones to rise and walk the cynical highway of modernity as pulsing bodies, a river of resistance, breaking the dam of delusion, editing the typos in history, shouting against the bias print, their actions screaming, long enough to tear your eyes away, long enough to screech into your ears. There are snipers in the air. Wake up, the war is here. Thank you, Pfizer, for, I would say, calling us to action, right? And helping us to cement the memory of King. Let's give another round of applause. Her collection of poetry is called Tangle, and which was published by the House of Nehisi Publishers in 2021. And if you haven't gotten your copy yet, it's time. Now, before I introduce the next person, I want to first of all thank the New Testament Baptist Church for opening your doors to us this evening. 
um, the Conscious Civic Foundation can be very controversial sometimes in certain spaces. So we are very grateful that you opened your doors to us in this hallowed space. Thank you. I hope that you set precedent for the rest of the community. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. He's a pastor, prophetic teacher, counselor, motivational speaker, certified integrative health and wellness coach, certified life coach. He holds a doctoral degree in ministry. He's a licensed international chaplain and an educator who's on a mission to biblically and holistically develop his generation. In 2009, after hearing the call of God to ministry, he resigned from his post as a qualified teacher to answer the call and founded the Life by Faith Ministries in St. Vincent. In 2015, he joined into St. Martin. Today, he is popularly known as the Laughing Pastor. That's why I was laughing. Mm -hmm. And on the 12 to 1 talk with Fernando Clark, aired on SOS Radio 95.9 FM, speaking every Tuesday on sex and marriage. He also appears on Radio Maranatha uh, um, 100.3 FM, Wind of Change program with Sister Sandra every Monday, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., speaking on health and other topics. Tonight, he's here to lecture on the topic religion and conscious action. Please give Dr. Nolan, sorry, Reverend Dr. Nolan Lanson a warm St. Martin welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to feel welcome in your very home. <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank the Conscious Lives Foundation for uh, having me be the featured speaker this evening. And I want to commend them on the work that they have been doing over the past 36 years. I think you can give them a round of applause. I want to particularly thank Suja, and I'm going to give you a joke because I like an active audience. When he asked me to speak, in fact, he didn't ask me, you know. We were in the radio station, and he says, Doctor, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. You are my speaker for this, <laughs> for this event. And almost like a divine moment, when he caught himself afterward, he said, I will await your answer. So I want to give kudos to Suja Rev. He's my good brother, amen? And he has Vincentian in his blood, which makes it even better for me. So I'm enjoying the best of two worlds. Good evening, everybody. MP George Pantoflet, blessings on you nicely. And to all who come this evening, I want to thank you for being here. My mouth is generally a big mouth, especially when we are, when I begin to speak. And I hope not to be too loud that you have to say, tone it down. But just in case, understand, it's a voice of passion. All right? Again, I say thanks to the Conscious Lyrics Foundation for this opportunity of being the 36th annual Martin Luther King lecture speaker, featured speaker. It is for me an honor, and in my presentation tonight, I hope to spark interest. I hope to stir existing knowledge and to inspire curiosity. Our mistress of ceremony says Conscious Lyrics Foundation can be controversial. Well, so too is the Bible. So the theme on which I shall speak, religion and conscious action, is narrowed down to answer the question of what positive action the church and religion can contribute towards advancing society from the unholy system of colonialism. To begin this lecture and to adequately answer this question, I think it is necessary we first ask what role religion or the church played in slavery. I want to read a short article 
that I found on the website of africannews.com, a short article. And I read verbatim. The Church of England on Tuesday apologized for past links to slavery by a related financial body now engaged in a wide-ranging process to compensate victimized communities. I am deeply sorry, responded Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, the spiritual leader of the Anglican Church. The time has come to take action in response to this shameful past. The report released to Tuesday follows revelations in June 2022 that the church commissioner's endowment had historical ties to the transatlantic slave trade. The Church Commissioners of England was established in 1948, in part with a donation from a fund donating back to Queen Annie in 1704, intended to help the poorest clergy. The report reveals that this fund had invested significant amounts in the South Sea Company, which traded in African slaves. It also received donations from people involved in the slave trade and plantation economy. The church commissioners are deeply sorry for their predecessors' ties to the transatlantic slave trade, the organizers said in a statement. The organization has pledged a fund of 100 million pounds over the next nine years for a better and fairer future for all. This money will go in particular to communities that have been affected by slavery, and I hope some come to St. Martin. Part of the funds will be used to further research the links between the church and slavery. The church commissioner's deputy chairman, Bishop David Walker, Walker sorry, of Manchester, said the organization now hopes to create a lasting positive legacy that will serve communities affected by slavery. The church commissioner's manager, a $10.1 billion investment fund to support the church and clergy. Nothing we do hundreds of years later will restore the lives of enslaved people, the commissioners wrote in the introduction to their report. But we can and will acknowledge the horror and shame of the church's role in the slave trade. And through responses, we will, we, we will seek to begin to address the injustices committed. The Church of England has previously apologized for its past ties to slavery as Britain faces the legacy of its colonial past. In 2020, the church called it a disgrace that some of its members had actively profited from slavery, end of quote. In a 2006 article, we read that the right Reverend Tom Butler, Bishop of, of, of Southwark, told the Synod, the profits from the slave trade were part of the bedrock of our country's industrial development. No one who was involved in running the business, financing it, or benefiting from its product can say they had clean hands. We know that bishops in the House of Lords with biblical authority, voted against the abolition of the slave trade. We know that the church owned sugar plantations on Codrington Estate. End of quote. Years ago, I also came across a documentary that highlights what is called the Slave Bible. It showed me how some of the songs we, sang, we sing today as worship songs were secret codes our ancestors used to escape the unholy system of slavery. Later on, during my time at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Teachers College, the late Oscar Allen came to deliver a lecture in which he emphasized that the Bible was used as a tool to enforce slavery. It sparked my curiosity then. And in my preparation for this evening, I tell you, the research was quite interesting. Some of which I hope to share with you. 
While the bitter truth is there and we must face it, religion also made a contribution worth observing. I read an article that was written by Courtney Ebersol. In that article, he stressed on the interviews of persons who were enslaved and lived after its abolition to tell their experiences. The article itself spoke of its core intent, which I shall quote, and I quote, through religion, enslaved people resisted slavery. Religious life in the enslaved community served as a defense against slavery and a source of collective strength. Religion offered a social sphere within enslaved communities that relieved experiences of dehumanization under slavery. End of quote. Even though it stood as a defense, we must admit that many manipulated its pure intent and only secretly was true religion practiced and embraced by enslaved persons. I wish also to draw your attention to a period that I describe as a very dark and evil conception. I will do so by making two quotes. One from James Baldwin who says, it is, a, it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. I have always believed that ignorance is the worst disease a man can have. But this other quote is also striking. Judge Bernard Shaw says, Beware of false knowledge. It is more dangerous than ignorance. The thoughts, they are not new. The very Bible says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 and verse 6. So whether we believe in God, It is, in, sorry, religion, whether or not we believe in God, is ingrained in the human spirit. That there exists a supreme being who is greater than us is the truth in every human spirit. So the need to pledge allegiance, to worship, and seek the support of God is a natural cry of humanity. And so, it was evident that colonial masters had to find a way to deal with the religious life of slaves, which offered relief from dehumanization. So with the intent to miseducate and preserve the unholy system of slavery, some sat down and decided to rewrite the Bible. This book, that I will later refer to was published by a collective group of missionaries called the Incorporated Society for the Conversion and Religious Instruction and Education of Negro Slaves in the British West Indies Islands. It was led or initiated by one, the right Reverend Belby Porteous, the president of that society of which is recorded of him to have said, and I quote, prepare a short form of public prayer together with select portions of scripture, particularly those which relate of the slave's duties towards the master. This is an Anglican bishop of London. That society extracted or omitted 90% of the Old Testament and 50% of the New Testament. So passages that shows God's disapproval of slavery or would encourage any form of uprising or speak of persons being liberated were deliberately omitted. Passages like Zechariah 7, 9 to 10, which says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, 
and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. What about the passages that are in the book of Exodus, where Israel, being enslaved, God commissioned Moses, and when he confronted Pharaoh, his very first words were, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. What about Genesis 15, 12 to 14, which give God's description of the time under which Israel would have been enslaved. In that passage, God was speaking to, Mo to Abraham. He says to Abraham, your people are going to be enslaved for 400 years. But what came upon Abraham, God described it as a horror of great darkness. And he says, when the time comes that I should deliver my people, they will come out with great substance. I think that's a good point for reparation. Great substance. Family, to think that men who are supposed to be of godly minds can conceive this level of wickedness to deliberately omit passages from the scripture for their own purpose of forcing submission, it is too much for the brain to comprehend. The attempt to keep a people not just ignorant but misinformed express the cruelty of a mind deprived of God. While that was in 1807, some of us may have come across the time of the apartheid. I was pretty young during those times. And I want to make a quote from Professor Lumumba. He says, the Dutch Reformed Church became the foundation stone upon which apartheid was articulated. In one of his address, he says the Bible has been misused. It has been used to support slavery, colonization, and to pervert the truth. End of quote. In 1986, Nellis Van Rensburg, the church's national moderator, he says, we were very much complicit in propping up apartheid. We provided the theological base for apartheid. And that's how ideology works. So the statement of Professor Lumumba is not one to be slighted. Because the very Bible itself affirms that it can be handled deceitfully or corruptly. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17 we will find the Apostle Paul saying, we are not of those that handle the word of God deceitfully. In that said book, chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, we are not of those who corrupt the word of God. So sometimes the Bible is not the problem. It is those who handle it. A knife can be made, was made, sorry, with good intent. But put it in the hand of a criminal, it becomes a murder weapon. So the name that is celebrated today, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., though known for his role as a civil rights activist, had his convictions rooted in the belief of the Bible. In fact, it was a divine moment that catapulted him into an even more firm conviction in his mission. And I want to quote from the book, Stride to Freedom, Toward Freedom. And I quote, verbatim, The most emotionally telling moment in Stride occurs when King recalls a crisis of confidence after receiving a particularly threatening 
late night phone call on January 27, 1956. Exhausted, discouraged, seeking a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward, he turned to God for help. After praying aloud in his kitchen, he experienced the divine presence, the presence, sorry, of the divine as I had never experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear a quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. Go and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. End of quote. It is, a, it is Archbishop Desmond Tutu who says, if you want to keep a people subjugated, the last thing you place in their hands is the Bible. And I agree with the bishop. You see, Dr. King had an understanding that God gives a man multiple callings. In our opening tonight, Madam Moderator said that a church, and I hope I quote you correctly, Words to the effect, a church that doesn't stand for justice. Say what? She can't remember exactly. Has lost its value or relevance. So he believed that the man has multiple callings. He recognized that we are called to our families. We are called to our churches. We are called to the workplace. And we are called to our communities. Failure to do any of these is the disruption of a, nature, of a nation. If a man looks into the Bible and does not see how he can serve in these four areas, at least these basic areas, he has missed the big picture. Luther's sermon on the Good Samaritan, he shared that the priest and the Levite bought, thought about what would happen to them but the Samaritan thought about what would happen to the man if he did nothing. You know, we have lost the thought of what would happen to the next generation if we in ours do nothing. And I want you to think about that. If you fail to act in your generation, what will happen to the next? Because our children are right behind. Our grandchildren are right behind. Our relatives, they are coming up. And if we fail to act in ours, we may leave a legacy that may shake us even in our grave. Slavery was an evil that disrupted our families, our church, our work and abilities to progress, and our view of the community. Though it's abolished, its system lives on, and we are deprived of the things our ancestors worked for and even died for. Permit me to paint a picture. The civilization of the slave masters was built during the course of the slave trade within 400 years. When they left our shores, we were left with nothing, still having to look to them for life sustenance. If it took them 400 years to build an empire with free labor and stolen wealth, how long would it take us to build ours if we must pay for it? I want you to think about it seriously. Because some who have been privileged, have forgotten this, and they chide their own people. It is King who said, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man to lift himself up by his own bootstrap. Today we are still expected to look to the colonial masters. And I don't think I have to go far to remind St. Martin 
of this cruel intention. Just reflect to the time when Irma came and we sought relief with our backs on the ground, boots were put at our necks. Don't you ever forget that. It came with stipulation. Somebody say, oh God. So the question of the positive actions the church and religion can contribute towards advancing society from the unholy system of colonialism, I consider it a simple one. Having recognized that the faith that we have come to appreciate and experience is brought into question because men, men of corrupt minds choose to use it not just wickedly, but for their own benefit, I believe that we are responsible to the following. One, we are responsible to shed light on the error that keeps a cloud of darkness on the minds of many. History will condemn us if we don't. It takes truth to refute a lie, and a lie that lingers will eventually be believed. Akile Mbimbe says, the only place we must start decolonizing is the mind because the mind is the standard of the man. Guji Watyongo, he says, all battles are fought in the mind. And Kojito says, I think, therefore I am. And the Bible that we read says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. Understanding, therefore, that incorrect information was deliberate, we must now be intentional about ensuring proper and correct information is given to facilitate proper convictions. Because whoever controls the mind controls your life. I was particularly encouraged in my preparation for this evening that Dr. King established in his church a committee to bring to the people current information on the political, social, and economic condition of Montgomery. It is Frederick Douglass who says, Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. I hope you can believe that. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. I'm an educator. And I believe that true education disqualifies any people from slavery or its system. Nelson Mandela says it this way. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. I come from a lineage of the Caribs back in St. Vincent. And while I was in school, I was taught that the Caribs were cannibals. Now, the only way you can see the cooliness of my hair was when I cut it short. <laughs> because my mother do carry my father hardcore Negro. And who then would want to identify with a race that is considered cannibal? You see, we are not chartering our own history in bringing correct information to our people. Furthermore, we have to recognize that white supremacy was used to form identity and false beliefs in us as a people. So our women don't embrace their natural beauty. We have eyelashes today. that act 
a spouting. We buy wigs from dead women. They call them natural hair. And from horses. Those who are ashamed of their color, bleach it out. Our language among ourselves is degrading. I'm certain you would have heard persons who said, Look at how you're black and ugly. Ah, that must change. We straighten our hair so fast, we can hardly wait to put chemical in our hair. We consider it coarse and thick. Yet, if it is left in its natural state, you are more diverse in your ability of style. Am I talking to my people? It is white supremacy that painted a picture of false identity in our people. You know, I have a 16-year-old princess. I've never given her a white doll because of this truth I'm sharing with you today. And for those who brought it, I deliberately refute it. We must know the intent. Added to that, the images of success, they were deliberately painted as white. So we need correct and factual information. And therefore, I commend forums like these once again Put your hands together for Conscious Lyrics Foundation. <laughs> Secondly, we must be of courage. To take a stand requires courage. Because everyone that ever stood against an unjust system with unjust laws come under heavy persecution. Therefore, we must be of courage because it is necessary to stand and be a voice of truth. Just as Martin Luther, we must stand at the forefront for rights and justice. Thirdly, it is incumbent on us to acknowledge that it's a system. Systems take time to build and therefore require time to break down. Systems are made up of law and order, structures that govern and direct the life of a people. Many of our laws are by nature colonial, meaning they proceed from minds that never have our interests at heart to begin with. And a judge is not to pass a sentence based on feelings of goodwill, but according to the laws that are established in the books, he or she must know or at least know where to find the law for each case he or she must judge. And there are times that we actively contribute to our own demise because we use and enforce colonial laws on our people. And this needs to change. We have the intelligence and the people to make the necessary change. When God took Israel out of Egypt, he gave them their own laws. It is King who says, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. There is a need for change in the system that was handed to us as a people. It works against us. I like the quote from Professor Lumumba. I happened to listen to a few of his lectures. He says, once our minds are changed, then our spirituality is energized. 
And once our spirituality is energized, then we exercise the ghost of low self-esteem. And when we exercise the ghost of low self-esteem, then we begin to discover our true potential. Then our economies will grow. It is important for us as a people to recognize and embrace the truth that we can manage and lead our own destinies. To do so, we must allow the mind to be properly developed and exercised. We must have confidence in our own historians, intellectuals, theologians, and so forth, who have been formed and fashioned with proper and wholesome information. I am grateful to the late Oscar Allen when he came to the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Teachers College and delivered the lecture and showed that the, the information we received in our high school days were incorrect pertaining to the Kari people. It might intrigue you to know that the very Bible we hold in our hands is 75% black. The black race is dominant in the Holy Scripture. We must ask ourselves, why is this truth hidden from our eyes? And why are all the pictures designed to paint otherwise? It is not an irrelevant topic, family. It is a truth that needs to be embraced and shared. A people that lack the truth and origin of their original history can never truly realize their identity. The human spirit was not designed for hate. And while I agree that information possesses the ability to ignite anger, we must embrace the words of the one whom we highlight and celebrate today, when he says, don't make anyone bring you so low to make you hate another. King is known for applying his biblical sermons to his congregation's vacations. Luther was right to recognize that God gives Christians many callings, calling to families, calling to churches, calling to a workplace, calling to a community. He was firm in his convictions, yet he was relevant to his generation. And I pray that we would be the same. I want to remind us as I wind down, because if you leave me, I can take all night. And you seem to be enjoying it, so you're very encouraging. I want to remind us That the 4th of April, 1968, which marks the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is only 54 years ago. What was his crime? He took non-violent and deliberate action in the name of God against an unjust, unholy, ungodly and oppressive system that seeks to dehumanize Negroes. I don't believe that we are totally out of the woods. So I was asked to speak on religion and conscious action. And I hope you have captured in my presentation here today that it was true through religion and decisive action that divine intervention was made possible and many things were accomplished in our quest to overcome an unholy system. And though much is still to be accomplished, like the ongoing discussion for reparations, I want to leave you with the words of Dr. King in his final message entitled, I have been to the mountaintop as he spoke about the fact that a plane had to be guarded all night simply because he was going to be on it. The said plane was delayed because they had to search every bag to ensure the safety of not just him, but all. And when he, was, when he landed at Memphis, he was met with threats. by some whom he described as sick white brothers. So he ended 
with his speech with these words. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We have some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I have been to the mountaintops and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And if there is anything that I would leave with you today, is that as human beings, we must endeavor to do God's will. And one of that is overcoming unjust and unholy systems like that of slavery. Let us do God's will. I think you should stand for that. I mean, weren't you moved by the message? Thank you, Reverend Dr. Manson. I would add to your accolades, political scientist. Um, as a budding political scientist myself. You mentioned two of the scholars that I, that I frequent, Dr. Ndenli and Dr. Ngugi. And it's true, the consciousness, your mind, is what really guides your understanding of your community. And you have to be watchful of the information that you get into, right? And he charged us with a responsibility to make sure that we understand that the Bible or the word can be misused. So you have a responsibility not to misuse it for your benefit, not at your mercy, right? So let us not suffer from cognitive dissonance because we got some new information this evening. So let's try to di digest it and see, you know, how we can apply it to our daily lives and take on that charge to read more. This is just the beginning, I think, and that we can do more to understand the role of religion in conscious action. So thank you as much. So now we're at that very interesting time of the program where you have opportunity to ask questions. We have allotted a half an hour to do that, 30 minutes. And I'd like to call Ms. Merlin Joseph to assist me with the Q&A se session. Are we using this mic? One. So please raise your hand or, or stand if you have a question. Not all at once, but you know, you can do it. This is a safe space, as I tell my students, it's a safe space, you can ask all the questions you want to. I took notes, I don't, did you not take notes? You should have a question. Okay. No? inspiring words today. I'm a believer and my name is Raymond Chesuhu. Speak out on behalf of the poor and the needy and judge righteously. You gave tonight a wake up call because how many of us in the body of Christ have the boldness to speak out on behalf of the poor and the needy. And how many of us really wants to go into the street and march for righteousness? Yes, when people hear my voice, they say, 
do they listen? It's not the only voice in the wilderness. It is the togetherness that we need. So if you already identify certain lessons okay, from the congregation of Dr. Martin Luther King, he had a committee and they did something. How many of those committees we have in our congregations, in our communities? I'm willing to support any of those with the information that we have, with the knowledge that we have, and with whatever we need for us to stand up for our rights. Because yes, you can speak out. But most important is to stand up for your right and not give up the fight. It is today that I have to bring this. Well, it was yesterday that one of my co-soldier passed away, Alberto Butte. We know him in the community as one that stands up, that has the courage to stand up. But how many of us really want to have that same courage? That same fearlessness that Jesus Christ also had. So it is with that that I would say, question. We need Christ? First thing. Or everybody can do this. Without Christ, we can't do it. So it's important that people have to take a decision. First and foremost, do you want to be a disciple? Do you want to follow Christ as Martin Luther King followed Christ? As you are following Christ, do we want to follow Christ and judge righteously? That question, I know the answer, but I still want to hear it from you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Brother Raymond. You know... I want to refer back to the part where I shared misinformation is worse than ignorance. It's a dangerous thing. We've never learned spirituality, Christianity in its true essence. And as a result, we've lost our purpose or our functioning upon the earth. We have taken an isolated position in many things. So for example, I want to give you how God describes his children. Jesus said, you are the light of what? Of the world. Light does a few things. Light exposes darkness. And it's content. And it shows you how you should walk. So we are not walking according to our true identity. Because light shines mostly among light in our practice of Christianity. And anything outside of that is almost deemed demonical. Add it to that. There's another description. He says, you are the salt of the earth. We are to preserve and maintain good morals. And our silence in many things in society has caused the society to be damaged. Because we don't talk. But when I read Stride Towards Freedom, I gained something. Because Luther had the same challenge. It was said before Rosa Park, there was a gentleman who got on a bus and he was tired. And he was told, because a Caucasian come, he was told, go to the back. He refused. And he asked his other brethren to stand with him, and none did. 
It is recorded that later on it was rumored he should have known better. So you see what happens sometimes. When we have come and adjusted ourselves to what seems to be peace, we rob ourselves of real peace. So we are, we are waiting simply to get to heaven, and you have that hope. But what about your time on earth? What about this time? The same Bible we preach, it says that God wants to bless us here on earth and at the end, eternal life. What about our time here? Do you know that when Israel was released from captivity, because of unjust laws, or not unjust laws, but, but unjust laws, yes. And because the king himself at the time who acted we did not legislate certain things, their work was delayed 16 years. If certain laws are passed in St. Martin today, the church will be crippled. So we have lost the essence of who we are. And we have answered to one call which is the call to the church. But what about the call to the community? What about the call to our families, which is falling like rain? In St. Martin, when I came, they told me that marriages that come here don't survive. In fact, when I told the guy, watch me, he says to me, I have heard better cock than you crow. And I'm looking for my brother because I want to tell him, have you heard this cock crow? <laughs> so I particularly fight for marriages because I believe that family is the core of society. And except we restore it to its original place, we would have broken politicians. Broken businessmen, broken preachers, broken teachers, broken administrators. If the family is broken, society is broken. So the church needs to understand its identity. It is Job who said, I was heir to the deaf and I was mouth to the dumb. In his plea to his brethren who accuse him, that he was fighting for justice. And I hope that we can take that position. I want to end by, by saying this. I hate the name Phillipsburg. So I invited Shuzeref right here. And I said, you can talk on anything about slavery, but that name. Educate our people. Because how is it that I am forced to prophesy when I say Phillipsburg? I release in the atmosphere a rapist, a murderer, a child molester. And we in our generation are doing nothing to change it. If we fail to change that, the spirit that hoover over St. Martin will not move. That name needs to change. You heard from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, we have on the front row. Please state your name before you ask your question. Thank you. And Sam. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is George Pantoplet. I went to MP. You all should know that. <laughs> um, Dr. Reverend Nanton, um, your lecture was insightful, profound, and I hope that we really accept and act upon it. Now, I'm not gonna make a statement because I think the issue is to ask a question. Um, but I must say one thing though. <laughs> I told the apostle where I go to church, I said that 
society is a reflection of the church. Society is a reflection of the church. If the church does not wake up, society will perish. And if my question to you is, because I've had it many times, is there, should there be separation between church and state? Well, MP George Pantoflet, you know, we have been praying for you so hard in this church. Man, I even call your name several times. If you ever decide to come out of politics, I'm going to pray you back in. Not in the church, in politics. So the question is, should there be a separation between church and politics? I know there are many discussions, many views around that. And while the separation may give leverage for certain roles, I'm giving my personal belief based upon the authority of Scripture. We are flawed because we have extracted only the religious aspect of Scripture. And we have missed God's intent. The whole of the Old Testament speaks not to the tabernacle, but to a nation. We read of David, we quote him, but we forget he was a king. We read of Joseph, we quote him, but we forget he was prime minister. We read of Daniel, we quote him, and we forget that he was president. We read of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we forget that they themselves were politicians. In fact, they were from royal family and chosen because of that purpose that they shall serve in Babylon. We read of Jeremiah, he was a prophet to the nation. We read of Ezekiel, the same. Isaiah, the same. So what is wrong with us? Incorrect information is crippling us as a people. So Christians refuse to go into politics. I told our church that I am raising up people who will serve in every sphere of society. Amen. At our church, we have a program that is called Dare to be a Daniel where we are challenging our children. The school system says, bring me 76%. I say to my congregation, bring me 80%. And the church will take care of your school fees. The church will take care of your school resources and give you extra for extracurricular activities. Why must we do that? The world that we are living in is a competitive world. And if we don't force our people to intelligence, they will be comfortable with idleness. In my home, I've brought from my home to the church. In my home, my children know my standards. All of my studies that I've done, I reveal my grades to them because there is a standard of 80% in my home. So we need to start to recognize that God has blessed us with intelligence. And that intelligence must not just simply shine on a Sunday morning. It must shine in politics. It must shine in businesses. It must shine in schools. I recently heard that we have taken prayer from the school. Why? When you put on godly mind to govern, they don't see the importance importance of the influence of God. So we have problems. So should there be a separation between church and state? My personal belief is no. That's my personal belief based on the authority of scripture. But when there is a merger, each must understand their role not to interfere too deeply with the other.
We have it there in St. Martin. And what is it breeding? Contention and unnecessary argument. So, my brother Pantoflet, MP Pantoflet. Now I heard him say something, and I want to, he said, everybody knows as George Pantoflet, so you don't have to say MP. I, I want to crave your indulgence, my brother, you need to say MP. Because St. Martin have something I can't take. We just say Silvera Jacob. Who is Silvera Jacob? We have to respect the offices. So MP Pantoflet, bless you nicely. We have two over here. Okay. Remember your name and please stand. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gwendolyn Holiday and I am an educator. Um, Reverend Dr. Stanton. Stanton. That was a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. And as educators in here, I think it really gives you some thought to think of. My question is, and I'm trying to be with the time, so I write it down. Based on what you have shared with us tonight, and it was a cross-section, a broad look, on what we, when I say we, persons who could align with me at this age, um, in terms of the education we have had. And I want to say here tonight, from since I returned back to St. Martin as a young person in 1983, I want to say that Conscious Lyrics Foundation continues to do a great job. and. One of the problems I had as being one of the leaders in education is that not enough educators make use of forums like this. So many of you know me and some don't, but I believe in consciousness and my whole family believe in consciousness. So my question is to Reverend, I always remember him as a smiling pastor. <laughs> I met him last year, and in one minute we clicked. Amen. And, um, and a lot of people don't know I love to laugh a lot. <laughs> so how crucial do you find self-consciousness for people to take a stand for what is right? or wrong, because in my opinion, that is what is breaking us here in St. Martin. We are too easy to give in, we are too easy to accept, and we are afraid of our own shadow. So that's my question. You know, the question sparked my mind back to the movie Roots. I remember when I looked at the movie Roots, I was with my bigger brother. <laughs> oh, God bless Moses. That man rushed to the TV. I swear he was going to throw it out. <laughs> it angered him. But there is something we need to pay attention to. Kunta Kinte. When he, came, he went to American shores, they begin to beat him. For what? To knock his consciousness out of him and to change his name to Toby. You remember that? How many persons watch Roots here? Many of us. Blows for one thing. What's your name? Kunta Kinte. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Why? His name meant something to him. It was who he, he is. It defines him. It gives him a sense of belonging and consciousness. And do you know that is what slavery has done to us? And so people who don't know themselves settle for abuse. 
realize. Until we come to realize who we are, then we will know our true potential. Are we together? When our ladies know who they are and embrace the natural beauty, you see all this straight now. Nah? Thank you for the encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, some of you know me. I'm Rochelle from Don't Break the Comb. Don't Break the Comb. Okay? But my question isn't about that. Um, you mentioned your brother having anger towards something that was factual. And I remember when I was in fourth grade, having anger during um, Black History Month when I learned of what happened in the past. And there was this one white girl in the class and everybody turned on her. We were, four, we were in fourth grade and nobody told us what to do with that anger. So my question to you is, what are practical steps this week that people in this building can take to uproot that bitter the bitterness, and go towards self-forgiveness, especially now that this society is narcissistic. How can you become self-loving without going overboard? It's a good question. I want to build upon our self-consciousness. When we understand who we are, we would know that we were built to love. We have to begin to realize who we are. Our spirits was not designed to do it. So that's why I love the quote from King when he says, don't make anybody bring you so low that you should hate another. And then we have to come to the position to recognize that the anger that we feel at times is really a cry for justice. But if we exercise that anger wrongfully, then what different are we than those who would have brutalized us? We become no different. So then we have to embrace the truth. I must be different. You have to start to make conscious decision. I must be different. I'm not as deep in history as Tuja. He is, he is he is one of the best, I'm telling you. But <laughs> but a little I know, like you said, just like my brother, when he gets back, I get back too. But I will not have moved. Listen, it's a film that really challenges your emotions. It's no easy film to watch, you know. It challenges your emotions. The other day, I was looking at a different film they put on in the house, and we just started to look at it. I tell my wife, I said, take it off, take it off, please, take it off. I don't want that kind of emotion right now. I'm good where I'm at. So sometimes if you can't face it, leave it until you have repaired yourself and recognize who you truly are. And you have made that decision that no man is worth hating. No man is worth hate, hating. Then we must recognize that, you know, I heard, uh, what's his name? I forgot now. A gentleman, he says something. I'm trying to remember his name. Anyhow, for what it's worth. Now my thoughts gone from me. Could you believe that? It's when you're fighting to remember one, you forget the other. <laughs> but we have to make decisions, my sister. We have to start with decision. Decisions are powerful. When we recognize that, oh, I got the thought now. He says Africans are the only people who recognize that we are all human race. You know it is sad. While we don't hate anybody, you know it is sad that everybody don't see it so. I went to the States in 
in Virginia the other day. Not the other day. Well, since the pandemic, I haven't gone. And when we met there, I went for a conference. It's amazing the level of inferiority that is still spewed out to us because of the color of our skin. And then in 2017, I went to the Ramesh Richard Evangelical training for pastoral, pastoral training. And we had to go out to different churches, and we went to one in particular. And I was there. And we had, I had my Venezuelan brother with me. He's high colored. And one of the leaders in one of the church that we went to, they're hearing it for the first time. I don't mind now. He came, and I was standing right there with my Venezuelan brother as if I didn't exist. And when the stage was open up, and it was time for us to do what we do best, I began to sing a song. When I come down, the gentleman came to me with all nice greetings now. I didn't return the favor because I know who I am. And I know in whom I believe. And I know my spirit was not created to hate but to love. So I give him what King gave. King said, they send dogs. They send hoes. But he says, we just march on singing, we shall overcome. And no matter what came their way, they maintain their true human identity, which is to love all humanity. So we have to make decisions. We have to recognize that if hatred is held, it damages only you. And if you are damaged, then you will damage others. And our pursuit is not to damage others. It is to build, to uplift, and to cause flourishing in our space. Do you have some good questions? Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lloyd Paul. Um, Fernando Clark referred me to Paul Lloyd, but it doesn't matter at this point in time. I want to, first of all, commend Conscious Lyrics for putting this program together. And Conscious Lyrics deserve a solid round of applause for that. And secondly, I, I want to thank um, the Dr. Reverend Nanton for his um, presentation this evening. Um, I wish that could happen every Saturday night <laughs> for, the next, for the next 400 years. Because if we have been destroyed based on his, what, he's pre what he presented, if our minds has been messed up for 400 years, we need another 400 years maybe to get it right. Um, you spoke a lot of stuff. And as you say, if we have to really delve into your presentation tonight, it will take us maybe until tomorrow, next week. Um, but some, some areas that you like that I want to commend on, comment on. Um, you said the Bible was, stuff was being taken out from the Bible um, in a malicious way to keep people, uh, it dominated at a certain level. We might have to do the opposite now. We might have to use the same Bible to repair and to replace what was taken away. That's number one. Number two, um, you made an important statement about representation in government. And too long, Christian folks have that notion and belief that if you're Christian, you should not be in government. But they're quick enough to vote for the non-Christian. So I, I don't understand the, the complications. I don't understand the, the, how you put that together. Too often they ask for um, people of certain moral standing, but they do just the opposite. So uh, that point you made maybe just passed through, but it's something to consider. You, you can't want grapes or mangoes but planting apples. Oh, you're going to get mangoes from apples. So we, we, need to, we need to consider this. And in addition to, to that, 
Uh, I think the, we, we're talking about slavery and we're referring to it in the past. It is still here. For a matter of fact, it is almost worse now than before. Because our people would have fought, some of us would have been you know, docile to a certain extent, but we need to understand the state that we're in. And, and, and when we look in today's date where um, you know, the colonizer is hanging up phones on our government officials, disrespecting them, slamming the door in their faces, and we just take that passively. Like, oh well, you know, we're black and it's our fault. And we go on our way, and when the, the, the next day come, and we, 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 don't, we don't have a passion for change. And we need to rise up. And that is because of lack of education. We, we too often depend on the guy in the pulpit. We too often depend on the man in the, in, the in, in the parliament. We too often depend on the woman in government. We have a moral and a civic responsibility to educate and to research. And if you can't read, ask your son, ask your daughter, ask your granddaughter to help you to, do, to get some information. Information is readily available. It's not like before, when we grew up in, 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 in the 40s. Books were not available. You could Google anything and get information. Yes, there's some bogus information, but you can, you can get the information that you need. My question to you, though, as a pastor, as a uh, person of cloth, as, as, as a leader for flock, how do you intend to mushroom what you just did tonight? Because when we come home, when we come go to church on Saturdays or on Sundays, we don't hear stuff like this. We hear about the Bible and, and, and what happened to Abraham, which is good, and what happened to Isaac and Esau and David. Fine, all of this is good. But we need to know what is going to happen to us, what is going to happen to our generations in this current colonial criminal system that we know in. And people afraid to call it for what it is. But that is what slavery was. And it still is the most grave atrocity that has committed and is still committing to our people tonight as we sit here. So I want to commend the congregation. Because I haven't seen that forum for a long time in those organ organized structure that the, the conscious lyrics has set up over the years. But it seems like people... People love church. So if, it, if that's where we got to get the message across, Pastor Nanton, we'll have to use the church to do it. But come high or low water, it has to be done. So my, my, my appeal to you is if you can talk to your other colleagues in ministry and get the other churches and leaders involved. And that cannot be spoken about isolatedly. It can't be once a year. It can't be when conscious lyrics invite this forum. It has to be on a consistent basis because change don't come, as you say, very easily. It has to be engraved and pushed and pushed until it happens so our generations, not only us, for years to years to come. And we could get our independence because we cannot depend on others who never had any interest in us to give us laws that would benefit us. We're looking for impossibilities. We have to govern ourselves. We have to set our rules. So when we say we don't want this as a nation, as an independent republic, nobody can tell us otherwise. Thank you very much for the time and for your attention. Well, you know, many of my colleagues or some of my colleagues are here tonight. And I'm happy that here tonight. Some have come to give support because their colleague is speaking. And I'm very excited about that. So I can say that you will look for the rise of the church. You're going to hear the voice of the church. If you ask of me personally, we have already started a discussion a long time. Just ask Suja, he's still to come back. I still have him. What we did is organize information sessions. And this year we are hoping to have 11 because January is our preparatory time. So we're hoping to have 11 and it's across the board. So we talk about slavery. We talk about this name that I don't like to call 
great bit our ancestors fought against it. We should too stop St. Philip's Bog. You're speaking a curse. So we had a session for that. And we have to continue that session. We have sessions that are, will be exposed to the public where we talk in politics, and this is election year. We talk in tax, and I wish the politicians, other politicians were here. Because a people that is well informed is a people that is properly prepared to take proper action. You know, the colonial masters were wise. They take charge of the education system. So it weakens our ability. And we really have to take time now to get that out. You know what is sad? I'll tell you what is sad. When you begin, let me use a personal example, lest I be prophetic. I remember I said to a gentleman, do you know that the Bible is 75% black? And he said to me, ah, this racial talk. You know, it's only us when we begin to speak about our own history and the truth of what occurred, we are seen as racial. Everybody else can speak except us. So I left him. I didn't say anything after that. I left him because I realized he cannot handle this level of truth. Why should we run from that? There's no crime in acknowledging it. There's no crime in recognizing that even Christ was black. There's no crime. You know, I want you to read your Bible. Because he was sent to Egypt to hide out. Are you going to send white among black to hide out? We have to think. Are we together? We have to stop and think. So you can't run from it. It is, it is what it is. All the movies we see of pharaohs are what? White. Yet your Bible says that an Ethiopian, like a leper, cannot change their skin color. So it tells us that once upon a time, the Ethiopian people had one color. And you guessed it right. So we have to think. Yet till we read our Bibles, and all we see, even if we are to enact the Pharaoh story, we're still looking for somebody white. If we put Goliath, we still look for somebody white. This is not racial. This is truth. And there can be nothing against the truth but for the truth. So what is wrong in stating the truth? It doesn't speak about us being superior and others being inferior. It is what it is. It is true. So we really need a revolution in education. And because persons have settled so much for uh, abuse, we become afraid to embrace certain truth. That can really mean a lot of liberation. So I think you, I just add to what you say because you have answered your own question so well. So I just agree with you. Mr. Clark, you're on a timer. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't think I have to introduce myself. I'm the one who made the pastor famous. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> When you all introduce him, I hear all this doctor, educator, and we forget one very important thing about him. He is the 2022 first runner-up in the dumpling and beef eating competition. <laughs> Don't ever leave that out again. Pastor, I've heard the word ignorance uh, mentioned very often. I've heard the word education very often. And we have a problem, now I can't speak for the rest of the Caribbean, I'm going to speak for St. Martin. When you don't control your education and the information that is being passed on, you have no control over that. 
when you are being told by higher powers, this is what you're going to tell your children. When I was growing up, I thought Columbus was the second best thing after Jesus. Then I learned that that was absolutely not true. But we were taught that. We were taught that Jesus was a white man. We were actually taught that. Then when I hear you saying he black, I say, but hey, we hear that. <laughs> you know, Jesus is a black name, it's a white name. I thought so, I thought Jesus was a white name. Then I learned it's a Spanish name. Everybody in Santo Domingo named Jesus. So. But let me get back to seriousness now. Our educational system that we have here, that we can control and determine what our children will be taught. You were a school teacher. What did you teach? Was it what um, they sent from England? Or was it what your government or your authorities taught that your youngsters should know? We are being misled completely with our educational system. And we are not getting the right information. We, we thought that we were wrong when it came to slavery. The blacks, the slaves were wrong for even wanting to run away from a plantation. We thought that was a crime. Because that's what we were taught. Now you're going to try to kick 400 years of education or what we were taught, misinformation, you're going to try to kick that out of us now in one night. You see your challenge? What did you teach while you were a teacher? And how do you see us getting out of this situation that particularly St. Martin is in right now? How do we get the right information? And how do we accept it? Because information can be there. But do you accept it? How do we do that? Well, we were given the time, and <laughs> I tell Clark, he don't take the place of God in a way. God could clout him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he raised a serious point. You know, he referred to me in particular. I taught maths and science, so I dealt differently. But I know the system that is given to us does not give correct information. I remember in Form 1 and 2, we had a, two teachers from the States, Peace Corps teachers. And everything that man teaches is Nevada, 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 Nevada. I get sick of Nevada. No relevance to us at all. So. For us to begin to change the system, we've got to begin to appreciate the intelligence that is among us. We, for some strange reason, appreciate strange voices more than our own. Look at Sujaref. I had to refer to him. You have been seen in blood, and he from St. Martin. So, I have to stay close to him. I get maximum protection from both countries. <laughs> no, but serious. The man is brilliant. Very, very brilliant. And yet, he is met with opposition, I'm certain, by his very own. Remember Martin Luther King in one of his lectures talk about if he had sneezed. From whom was he stabbed? He's very old. So sometimes when people don't understand the struggle, they fight their very own. Because when you are coming against a system, you will be met with resistance. And the resistance is going to disrupt the peace. We must see it. It is temporary uh, disruption. Because Things may appear calm, but it might be stifling. And I know we're on time, so I'm going to say it this way. Appreciate our own. Begin to allow our 
intelligence to frame our education so that our generation coming up can be fashioned and formed uh, by the correct information. Are we together? Otherwise, we are not going to stop um, the system from its control. You know, and I know we're given the time, so I'll take the liberty at the same time to thank you so much for coming out. And I want to thank Conscious Lyrics Foundation. I thank all of you for the questions that you've asked. You are a wonderful audience. And I'm very hopeful that, you know, we are going to take certain stance. And if there is one stance I want us to take, it's against Felix Borg. Thank you again, Doc, Reverend Dr. Nolan Mendel. Thank you again. And I hope we listen to the charge. We have a lot of instructions from tonight on, this evening. You can go home and tell your family members, I listened to this great lecture, and we have some action points to engage with. And they're very small, really. You know, he said, lead with love. Lead with love, right? So I would want to, um, you know, thank you all for being your host this evening. This is my first time for the year behind a mic, and hey, I'm in the pulpit. <laughs> I wonder what that means for the rest of the year. <laughs> great expectation, great expectation. But I will call Mr. Suja Ref, the president of the Conscious Lyrics Foundation, to give a vote of thanks. Give Cindy a round of applause. She did a brilliant job. Well, we're not going to keep you much longer. We got a couple little things to do. Um, we want to say thank you to a few folks who made it possible. Uh, when I left downstairs just now, there are a few people. When I, when I come back downstairs, I got more people. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, let me just start by thanking Cindy, our MC, for tonight. I think she did a brilliant job. I want to thank. Alexia Nanton, who opened with a wonderful prayer. I also want to thank the choir who bring us across the rivers of Babylon. They did a, they did a splendid job. I also want to thank the many folks who made it possible for us to be here. Well, you know I'm a part of SOS, along with Fernando and Billy Dee, we are one SOS family. But I always still say thank you to SOS Radio because I'm sure majority of you heard, heard this news on SOS Radio. Okay? So I want to thank the management of SOS Radio for making this possible. I also want to thank the folks from um, My88.3 um, who give me the opportunity to do the interview as well. I want to thank um, the... Um, the folks from PJD2 as well who made it possible for us to who, who also give me the opportunity to promote this event. We, we try every year and um, he said it the, Mr. Jesse Run said that we his soldier, his comrade left us. I want to mention something about that as well. Um, Alberto Butte who really is a stalwart, and you, you guys know him for what he stood for. He took on a whole establishment all alone and become, became victorious with it. But it's not just that, but he was always involved in the community, and we lost him. So, you know, I want to send out my condolences to the family, and, and when you meet them, you send, 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 give them your condolences as well. At this stage, we, we do something very special every year at this time of the year. I, I laugh when I hear the joke on stage about me demanding. <laughs> well, if you had no all would be on that. <laughs> if you had just know the truth. So last year we were trying to do this, what we're doing, what we're going to do this year. Um, we didn't have a public event last year. You know, we were still in a whole pandemic crisis. So we had, we had a Zoom event, 
but we try our best never to miss the Martin Luther King Lecture Series. I, I honestly think that the information that we need to share should never stop. I, I cannot, I don't know how to do it, okay? I, I really don't know how to, people that say, but I should say you have been consistent. I don't know anything else. Honestly, if I don't do Martin Luther King, I, you know, this might sound bad saying this, because people say I must repeat it. I think I have a purpose in life, and if I can't do it, I don't think I should live. That, that's how I feel. Now, you don't have to agree with me. But I'm going to fulfill what I think is my purpose. And when I'm, when I'm finished, I'm completed, somebody else is going to carry it on. So every year around this time, Sandy can come next to me, she can help me with this. We does um, choose a person, a personality of the year. But you know, we have difficulties every time getting the person in the audience. So we see we had to come up with some kind of trick <laughs> to get a person in the audience. So last year we didn't get to do nothing, the whole thing was on Zoom, right? And you know, you invite the people and say, yeah, I've got to come to the event. They say, yeah, I'll come, and then bam, they don't show up. So now, you mentioned them. To me, it's much nicer to give back the award when the person is present, okay? Then you say to here at the event, and then tomorrow you've got to go at the house or at the office to present them the award. So last year, we had somebody who was a nominee, and we decided that we didn't do none last year, so the award going to be for two years back to back. <laughs> so the person was now who we're going to give the award to this year is the person who would be our personality of the year 2021 and also 2022. For the work they have been doing in the community, for the contribution that we have seen, the growth, the growth process within the St. Martin community and the respect I think they have acquired over the, over the time period that they have been active. But also is to say thank you. So what we're going to do, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me, we're going to call Dr. Reverend Nolan Nanton back to stage. <laughs> and present him with our Personality of the Year Award. But this year, we have decided to rename the award. The members of the Conscious Living Fund, they know I got a good team, you know, Cindy, Merlin, they, they, they just keep me on my toes. So <laughs> I, I think they're easy. <laughs> so we came up with a new award. We came up with a new title for the award. And a new title for the award is the Lillian Stephen Annual Award. You see, you saw her reaction? Yes. And the reason for that was 36 years ago, when we started the Martin Luther King Lecture, it was all her idea. I'm, I'm 36 years late. I really feel bad about it. But it came from these brilliant minds of conscious lyrics who said, Chuja, we should do something for Lillian. So from as, as of this date, every time we get back the award for the year, it's going to be named after Lillian Stephen. And those of you who know Lillian Stephen, that's the mom of the MP Christopher Emmanuel, who was tragically taken from us in 1996, October. And I'm going to let <laughs> you, you want to share with the people what's on the inside? Now you guys ain't know what it is, right? Let me, let me tell you what it is. Yeah, I need to show them the rest of the stuff. Man. There's books. Okay. That's, for you. That's for your reading. Oh. <laughs> 
That's, that's the ring of love. He has been preaching love and better relationship on the radio for the last two years, consistently on Tuesdays. And he has impacted the St. Martin community. We wanted to award him last year. So the demand to get him here <laughs> was to make sure to get, we gave him the award in presence of you, okay? But we did a little better. We decided to come to his home to do it, okay? So we, he couldn't tell us no. <laughs> if you have anything to say, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I was sitting there, and I really didn't know it was coming. So then I hear the man call my name and say, eh, God bless Moses, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, w I really want to thank the Conscious Leagues Foundation, and now I understand. You know, I was telling my wife when Suja asked me, just tonight I was rehearsing a thing to her. I said, it's like a divine moment come upon him. He said, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And then he gained consciousness, and he says, I'll wait your answer. <laughs> but I thank you so much. My brother, and I thank Conscious Lakes Foundation. And, you know, my true hope is, I was still clocking this all the time, and why I go after marriages so hard, I really believe that every marriage stands, make Jesus smile. And added to that, it makes our community stronger. And if you can help me with that fight, I would feel so accomplished. And we will all share in this reward tonight. So thank you. Uh, this is a reward I accept, but I know it's one for all of us because you have made the program what it is. I want to thank also the African market. That, that's the name of the store, Af African market. Uh, my brother Anthony and his lovely wife, who is always a contributor that at the back of the room. They're always, they, they got me looking good, right? This is from them. So if you want to get some African wares, go to the African market just across from Orania School. Um, also, I want to say a special thanks to the House of Nehesi for the books that we give Pastor Nanton. I want to thank the members of Conscious Lyrics for harassing me and making it possible for us to do this. Merlin, thank you very much for, for um, contributing. Um, Cindy did an excellent job. Thank you very much. And all the other members who are not present. Thank you um, for coming out this evening. For those of you who have been congratulating me for the award that I got in the United States just early, late last year, um, it was because of you. <laughs> it's because of you and all these events that we organize, you coming and being present and making sure that you know these events live on. It is out of that where the award came from. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And you can socialize a little bit, and then safe journey home. And our next event is going to be next month for the Black History Celebration. We already have the lecturer um, who is going to be doing the lecture for us. Uh, we didn't give you the date yet, but it's going to be the final Saturday in the month of February. Uh, the venue is going to be announced. We also have a <laughs> The church. <laughs> the, 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 the church <laughs> okay. Um, we also, we, we're putting together, I see the director here, so I ain't going to call your name yet. But we have written a, a, a script on the story of Loki. The title of the script is Spitfire, the, sto the story of Wantete Loki. It's a play. It was 10 years in the making. It's, final, it's finalized now. It's written. We're going to be doing some additions soon, so interested in acting in that play. Uh, when we put out a call on, on the radio, or we, we'll be inviting you to come and audition. The director would, would be the judge of that. That's one of the, the activities we're going to be doing this year for sure, and we really like to get us that play on stage. And then you all know the book fair is coming up June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd this year. One, two, three in 2023. So, so you're going to be part of that as well. So those are some of the events and activities. But you know, we got a social study competition, and that was going to be on the 27th of, June, of May um, coming up. And we're including 
we have written to other Caribbean islands, so we're going to include other Caribbean islands this time around. We have been getting some positive response thus far, so we're looking forward to that as well. So we want to thank you for really sharing this evening with us, but thank you more for sharing all the time you have shared with Conscious Livings um, for the 36 years of celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday with us and also for the last 30 plus years sharing time, 31 years with the Conscious Living Foundation. Thank you a whole lot, and it means a lot to us. Safe journey home, and happy new year to all of you. Bye-bye. Just swipe up the camera. Go back to the thing, swipe up the camera.